stress in our lives. Anybody ever get stressed out here? <laughs> well, we're going to look at God's Word today, and I truly believe that if you abide by these words from God's Word, that your stress will be relieved in many, many cases. So we're going to look at that, but I want to start with this premise. We want to start with this understanding. First of all, we sometimes have this feeling that God loves us when we do what we should. When we behave, when we do what we think God would want us to do, then in return, God shows his love for us. But friends, let me tell you one thing. God always loves us. Amen. I mean, we talk about unconditional love, a God made love, they say in the Bible. God always loves us. And sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend because we live in a world that we say uh, we love you. We take vows to say, I'll love you forever until I die. <laughs> But I tell you one thing, if you don't do what I want you to do, I'm not going to love you as much. So we set guidelines for our love. God loves at all times. Even if you don't, listen now, even if you don't want him to love you. And I've seen some people that are so frustrated in life, I say, yeah, I would love to just talk with God. Because i got a few questions I want to ask him. And this God is who he says he was. I want to talk with him. I tell you what, I don't care if you don't love me. It doesn't matter to me. Folks, even in that, you can't get God to stop loving you. So we're starting with that premise today as we look at this passage. The passage today, we're going to look at a few. And I will tell you, in some of the passages, the scripture that we put up comes from the message translation. I don't recommend that you use that translation of the Bible for all you look at in the Bible, but it's a good one to lay beside your other uh, translation. But some of the passages will come from that, and we'll try to note those as they do. But this morning, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Father, we pray that you're moving an awesome and powerful way here. Father God, I've got to get out of the way. People need to hear from you. And Lord, we just pray now that the Holy Spirit moves in an awesome and powerful way. Father, uh, people here are dealing with different issues, some concerns, some, some for them it's the best time of their lives. And Father, they're just here to rejoice with you. But Father, you know each and every situation. We pray through the Holy Spirit. You speak to all of us, Father. Lord, I pray now that I may decrease, that you may increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed are the meek. Meekness. One of the first things to relieving stress is that we need to become meek. But we don't like that word, do we? Meekness sounds a whole lot like weakness. Sometimes we'll say to somebody, well, they're meek and weak. <coughs> well, my goodness, you think they're frail and they're meek and they don't, you know, uh, you can slap on one side and slap on the other side. It doesn't matter. They're not going to say anything. But folks, in the Bible, the word meekness really means strength under control. Jesus was meek. He was strength under control. He had power. He had the ability to do many things. But in his meekness, he chose not to use his strength and his power in all situations. Now that's tough in our in our workplaces, isn't it? I mean, if I'm if I'm getting ready to hire somebody, I know I want somebody that has some confidence to, to do some things. This is what I do, and I'll do this, and I'll think I'm the greatest thing since peanut butter. You know, you want that sort of that kind of mentality. But you can still have confidence in yourself and be a, and show meekness. And this morning, we're going to try to unfold that to help us ultimately in dealing with stress. The number 
one thing that we, um, everybody remember the old Bullwinkle show? I'm pretty sure those people that did that Bullwinkle show was on something. I don't know that for a fact, but man, that's some pretty wild stuff. But what they always do, they, they'd have the name of the show or, and they'd tell you another name. So this is let God be God in your life or your guarantee for stress relief. Okay? So we're going to uh, begin to look at that. Number one that needs to be done. Pardon me. Put Jesus in control of your life. Number one, put Jesus in control <laughs> of your life. We wake up each morning, whether we realize or not, and decide who's going to be the boss that day. We decide who's going to make the decisions, who's going to call the shots. In Job chapter 22, verse 21, <coughs> It says, uh, submit to God and be at peace with Him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Again, submit to God and be at peace with Him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Once again, we're looking at, at making sure that we are putting Jesus in control of our lives. Now, I'm going off a little bit for just a moment, but stay with me. Uh, Job 22, 21, another one, acquaint yourself. That's why I go back to that other one. Okay. The acquaint one. <laughs> acquaint yourself with him and be at peace, thereby good shall come to you. Acquaint yourself with him, that is putting him in control. Now in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That word knowledge there means a super knowledge. It means a personal knowledge. You hear me say over and over again that religion will do one thing for you. It will send you to hell. You're not supposed to say that. Listen now. If you don't have Jesus and you don't have a personal relationship with them, you have no idea what it is to follow Jesus Christ. And there are people that have gone to church for a period of time and have maybe even got involved in some church things, but they come out with this conclusion. It didn't change my life at all. I did what I thought I was supposed to do. I did what they told me to do. I did the do's. I don't do the don'ts. You don't do the don'ts. I, I didn't do the don'ts. Just figure that out for yourself. I did what I was supposed to. I didn't do what I was not supposed to. But I found out that it just didn't make a difference in my life. Now, folks, one of the hardest people to get back into church is someone who says, I've tried it and it didn't work. And I always bring back to this. It is through the knowledge Grace and peace. This, this is a tragedy. When someone wants more than anything in their life, peace and contentment. And they've been told by a mother, a sister, a friend, that you need to get involved in church. And they get involved, and there's no peace. Get involved in church, but you've got to get involved with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no other way to say it. Religion will work for a while, but it won't last. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ will change your life. And what I'm saying is, if you don't know my wife, I can tell you that she is five foot four, she weighs 120 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a good evening for me, I think. <laughs> she has brown hair and, I always call them rainbow eyes. 
You look at her eyes, Bill, of what she has on. Her, her eyes just change colors. And you could say, okay, I know about her. But unless you spend time with her, you couldn't say, I know her. And sometimes what can happen in church or just getting religious is you know about God. But you don't know Him. And I tell you one of the most exciting things. When you see someone that's tried religion, and folks, Holy Spirit is leading on this. I'm getting a little bit away from it. That's okay. When you see somebody that's tried religion, and then they try a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden, there is no better feeling as a pastor or as a Christian as a believer, when you see, they got it. They got it. Okay. I didn't bring it here to tell you that. Uh, no, I did. Holy Spirit. Amen. Put Jesus in control of your life. Sometimes we fuss about God being in control. God, you made me too thin. God, you made me too fat. God, you made me too, too uh, tall. God, you made me too short. God, why did you make me not as far as other people? God, why do some people seem to have a lot of talents and, and I don't have as many? And how come now that uh, everything I eat just as it goes right to my stomach? How, how come you do this? How come you don't do that? And, and Lord, I was wondering what to do. And God, why don't you ever speak to me? Well, my goodness, you can't get a uh, word in edge one. <laughs> Let me tell you a secret about prayer. There needs to be some time in prayer of saying absolutely nothing. And just be with God. Sometimes people say, this came to me. And they'll, and they'll say, it came to me, I woke up during the night, and this just sort of came to me. And oh man, it was awesome. Well, one thing, sometimes, if we don't spend time in prayer and some quiet time, quiet in prayer, the only time God can speak with is when you're asleep because you're always doing everything else all the time. <laughs> Take time in prayer just to be with God. Okay. Have you ever been around a back seat driver? <laughs> Has it ever crossed your mind to just say, I'm just going over this cliff. <laughs> <laughs> Take a left. The best way to go is to go left and go to right here. Now, I tell you what, if there's too much traffic, then I usually go around this way. But I tell you what, sometimes this time of day, is, it's, it's this much traffic and it's backed up there. So if you go this way, actually, if we left her, we've been able to do this. But if you go, you're going 45, it's 45 speed limit. I used to go 52, they won't get you. <laughs> Matthew 16, 24. And this comes from the message. Translation. Then Jesus said to the disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must decide to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So do we have the next one? We do. Okay. Jesus said, Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me leave. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Jesus said, Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me leave. One of the first decisions that you need to be made is to let God be God in your life and to let Jesus be in control. Sometimes we let Jesus be in the driver's seat, but we're backseat drivers. No, Jesus, I need to go this way. I need to go this way, this way. I want to go. Go this way now. Now, I want you to drive, but you, I want you to go the way I'm telling you to go. And folks, it happens, doesn't it? And that brings on added stress because we go down a road that we don't know what the outcome of that road is. Well, but we're bound and determined that that's the right thing for us. We have to be bound and determined to put Jesus in control of our lives. You ever watch Dancing with the Stars? 
Nobody? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's not what they say. Yeah, I do, I do it all the time. <laughs> I cannot dance. I know it's a surprise, doesn't it? I look like an ostrich has been in a tragic farming accident. <laughs> I'm just sort of like this. I just can't dance. <laughs> But if my wife and I dance, and we've been dancing since we were married, so that's all of our lives, it does make a difference who's leading. And sometimes one of my great enjoyments, because I know I can't dance, is to go to a place where there's dancing and watch other people mess up. But somebody's got to be in the lead. And too much in our life, stress is brought in because we're fighting God over who's in control. And we may say, if we're not careful, oh, God is the God is the co God is the pilot, God is the driver. But if not careful, we become backseat drivers. There was a tour guide that was in Africa that was taking people out to see wild elephants. He told them, you've got to remember two things. Number one, when I say run, run. Don't question, don't think, don't decide to take one last picture of the elephants. If I say run, you run. Second of all, when you run, you follow the exact same path that I'm going in. Because if you don't, you're liable to step on something you don't want to step on. So they took they took this out, uh, took the guide out. The elephants began to stampede. The, the guide turns around and says, run! A couple people stood there. I don't know if they got frozen, what happened. They just, uh, they just stood there. He said, run! And then they went off. Now, here is the thing, God, when God says run, or God says no, and, and let me preface it with this, even though I'm going to do it in a minute. <coughs> I am a big advocate to say, listen, when you become a child of God, we're not going to give you a list of do's and don'ts. Because I believe that if you fall in love with Jesus, it's going to be like falling in love with your mate or someone very close to you and you desire to do nothing that would ever hurt them. So the do's and the don'ts, and you've heard me say this many, many times, the do's and the don'ts will take care of themselves. But the do's and the don'ts are also needed at times. On that tour, he didn't tell them to run for no reason. He told them to run to save their life. That is to follow Him. God tells us in our lives to follow Him. We've got to decide ahead of time to put Jesus in control. Not wait till we're right on top of the temptation and say, okay, now God, you're in control. Because I tell you what, you're failing. Each day, you decide. God, you are in control. Number one, put Jesus in control of your life. Number two, establish God's word as the authority in your life. Establish <coughs> God's word as the authority in your life. This is the authority. This is what is the authority in my life. You need to, we need to establish that. If you have no authority... Your life will be a constant change, back and forth. Whether you're going with this new wave or this new thing or uh, all this politically correct stuff and all this and all that. And you're, you're just, your life can be in turmoil. A authority simplifies the decision making. Let me give an illustration. As many of you know, the week before last, I told you last week that I was at the beach and about five feet away from me, that black tip, five foot long black tip shark came up right beside me. Um, I noticed that on, on beach, 
And a red flag will tell you that there's some bad current out there. And that's put up there. Now, if you go down to the beach and it's telling you that there's <coughs> bad current, riptides, I believe they called in, and, and the flag is up there posted to let you know, to warn you that there could be danger in the water. Well, when you look at that, what's your first thought? They just want to ruin my day. That's exactly the reason they put that up there. They put it up just to irritate, irritate me, to cause me not to do what I want to do, not to cause me to have the joy and the happiness that I want to have. They put it up there for that. You can begin to say that, first of all, I think it's just stupid. I mean, it just doesn't make no sense. It's for people. Listen, we can go on in because it's for people that really don't know how to swim. So the flag is up there, not for me or people that know how to swim. It's for those that don't know how to swim. So it's really sort of, in a way, sort of a stupid flag. We, we can ignore that. Another thing, it's probably out of date. When did they last check the current? That thing was up there yesterday. It's out of date. They just put it up there so they can protect themselves. Uh, it's not going to do any good. You don't have to worry about it. Or you can say, that's not what it means. That red flag does not mean that there, there's current issues. Uh, that, that's not what that means. It means something entirely different. Now, it used to mean that, but now, today, since it's outdated, it, it doesn't mean that now. So, it just... The way I look at it, what it's saying to me is there's not going to be as many people in the ocean. You go get out there. <laughs> because I can do that. Now, folks, in the same way, the Bible tells us different things, the do's and the don'ts, and we can look at them in the exact same way. We can look at it and say the reason God put that there is to take away my fun and ruin my life. Man, I mean, really, who wants to be going around all things, okay, can I do this? Let me check. No, I can't do this. Can I do this? No, I can't do this. No, I can't do this. Man, what kind of life is that? So God puts those in there, and what it really do, does is ruin my life. Have you ever heard this? Oh, I believe in Jesus. And sometimes this happens with young people. And I want to accept him as my Lord and Savior. And I'll follow him one day, but I want to have some fun first. When God puts a flag up, there's a reason behind it. Well, maybe it's just stupid. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Here's one, premarital sex. Does anybody follow that rule anymore? I mean, it's sort of stupid. And it's really out of date for our time, isn't it? The day and age we live in, the freedom that we have, we don't need to follow that one. It's sort of outdated. And that's not really what it means. I had a person tell me that they were engaged, getting ready to get married, so they went ahead and had sex because it's okay if you're going to get married anyway. Again, sometimes those warnings that God puts up is not to ruin our lives, but to bring peace and contentment. And, and again, they're not there. If we see them as the do's and the don'ts, then that can be frustrating. And people will use that against us as believers. But when we decide that God's word is our authority, then when we see the red flag, we know it is in our best interest. Amen? Amen. <coughs> now, the Bible can have some passages 
that can be a little bit challenging. Now the passage that says, do not worry about anything. Matthew, Matthew 6.25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. How? <laughs> that's a tough one. That's a tough one, isn't it? Do not worry about your life. But in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, God says, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. I think we have the message. It says, I'll put my spirit in you and make it possible. Aha, here we go. Make it possible for you to do what I tell you and live by my commands. I will give you. I will make it possible. I'll give you the power to be able to do that. You know, there's folks, there's some things in my life that I just need power. I think I've told you guys several times. I think I keep telling you because I'm going to make myself do this. My sons gave me a six months pass to the YMCA. I was going to go up there, but I spilled my whopper dripped on me, and I thought it wouldn't be right to go in to the spa with uh, whopper juice on me. So, um, but, but I need power. There was a guy, he used, to, he used to come here, his name was Tim Brown, he moved away, and he was getting a bicycle together for me. But prior to that, he got me a shirt. Have anybody seen those bicycle shirts? <laughs> now, I took this shirt back, and I told him, there is something defective about this shirt. Do you see what, how it sticks out in front? <laughs> something was so wrong, I don't know what it is, but I want a new one on my money back, whatever you can do. <laughs> but he gave me this shirt, and those bicycle shirts are skin tight. When you get on a bike and you start riding, they start creeping up. <laughs> and I look like a half-open can of biscuit. <laughs> yes, I need some strength. tell you from the bottom of my heart. This is what I said earlier. Let God be God in your life. Decide that Jesus will be in control. If not, you're liable to try religion and say it just Decide this very day that I'm going to put Jesus in control of my life. Let me tell you, when things happen during the day, when you realize that Jesus is in control, there's some stress release. <coughs> Establish that the Word of God is <coughs> your authority. Not that it's a list of all these do's and don'ts. But when there's a don't do it, God is saying, my child, you're my child. Decide he's in control. Use God's will. Establish God's book as your authority. When you do that, a lot of decision making takes care of the sin. And if you will do it. Now let me tell you this. I, I know the hour's late, but I, I got to tell you this. Listen, right now, the Holy Spirit will move in your life for many of you and saying, you know, that's exactly right. That's what I need to do. But let me tell you that. When the Holy Spirit moves like that, when you leave here today, Satan's going to be greeting you right when you get in your car. And I don't know, but he may be saying something like, oh, hey, uh, that's one of those things where, where you got to do this, you got to do all that kind of stuff, and this, this, and that, and, and now it's just going to be like you're going to be in jail, and you're going to be caged in, and forget about having any kind of fun. 
Let me tell you this, folks. If you do this, joy will be in your life that you can never imagine. And I can't use the right words to tell you that. You have to experience it. So this day, I encourage you just to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We'll have an invitation here in a minute. And, I, and folks, I'm not... Um, I'm not about you necessarily having to come down and pray for you and talk to me. During the song, you can talk, you can talk to God right where you're at. If you ever want to talk to me, you can come down. I'll be happy to pray with you. Or you can let me know, and I'll talk with you later. But today, you want to make that life less stressful. The ability to have contentment and peace and follow. Not because of who I am, but because of who. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. For your love, your compassion, your grace. Father, there's often times in our lives that I'm very thankful for warning signals. Father, I'm thankful your warning signals as well. Father, I do not see them as a burden. I see them as bringing victory to my life. But Father, the challenge is tough. The world says you don't need it. The world says that we're backward and that we're out of touch. Father God, your word doesn't change. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means when your Bible says you love us, you love us yesterday, today, and forever. Father God, I just pray as the Spirit moves in this place, the people will respond either by just speaking to you during the song, coming forward, or perhaps in the days to come, to tell someone I just want to talk to someone. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. And God, we are going to decide this day to let you be God in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>